the point of discussion today the seventh class the recap of the previous six classes are all this that we learned introduction to embryology where we learned the basic processes terms the significance of learning embryology and roles of various reproductive organs the second class of gametogenesis there was a recap on the process of meiosis spermatogenesis and oogenesis the third class we learned events that happen in the first week of intrauterine life that is namely fertilization cleavage and beginning of implantation the second week events are completion of implantation development of trophoblast embryoblast and bilaminar germ disk third week conversion of the germ disk into trilaminar germ disk by formation of intraembryonic mesoderm primitive streak inducing it and then of course formation of chorionic villi which will be elaborating further today four to eight week and fetal period is where we learned how the fetus grows no space available so folding happens so might start developing and then the various layers give rise to derivatives so we have learned the derivatives of various germ layers right very good so i'll ask you one because just the previous class yesterday anybody can specify derivatives of ectoderm what do you remember derivatives of ectoderm neural crest nervous system develops from ectoderm very good okay then epidermis of skin develops from ectoderm very good mammary gland so appendages of skin very good glands all these are derivatives of ectoderm fine so today the topic of discussion is this what does this image look like ha ah, so this is placenta and what you see on the surface here is the umbilical so the topic of discussion today is placenta and membranes so as you identified this as placenta what made you identify this as placenta umbilical, umbilical cord okay so umbilical cord help you to identify this as placenta so definitely you must be knowing what placenta is yeah anyone from the back can you let us know what placenta is so placenta is an organ that connects mother and the fetus very good so that's correct anything else that comes to mind about placenta why it's placenta what is the shape disk like like a pancake chapati like a dosa so pancake shape that's why it is called placenta latin word greek word shape remember anatomical terms principal mere memory science so placenta means like that of a pancake so what we'll be discussing in the next 40 minutes or so is all this placenta chorion amnion yolk sac allantois umbilical cord what are the competencies that you will be attaining by the end of today's class describe formation functions fate of the chorion amnion yolk sac allantois and decidua describe formation structure of the umbilical cord describe the formation of placenta its physiological functions fetal maternal circulation and placental barrier describe the role of placental hormones in uterine growth and parturition and describe various types of umbilical cord So breaking the competencies into smaller units that's objectives we'll be learning morphology classification and functions of placenta structures that form the placental barrier embryological basis of placental anomalies we'll learn the definition of fetal membranes we'll learn the functions of fetal membranes and clinical importance of fetal membranes this is what we'll be 
So, placenta, as you identify placenta with the umbilical cord, an umbilical cord is a mode of connection between the mother and fetus. So, naturally, the surface where the umbilical cord is seen is referred to as the fetal surface. And the opposite surface, which is embedded in the mother, womb of the mother, is referred to as the maternal surface. Very simple to identify this. This is smooth, shiny, this is rough, ragged, bloody, very stark difference, very easy to identify the fetal and maternal surface of placenta, disc shaped or pancake shaped. Now, if you look at this maternal surface, you can see there are grooves here. And more or less these areas are like pyramids. So, these areas are referred to as cotyledons. Cotyledons. Botany, remember cotyledons. Cotyledons. So, these larger ones on the maternal surface are referred to as maternal cotyledons. They are about 15 to 20 in number. The same thing happens even on the fetal surface. But they are more in number, smaller and more in number, around 40 to 60 in number. The fetal cotyledons, of course, are based on the fact that there are branching of the fetal vessels that happen and then each area surrounded by those branches are the cotyledons. So, if you take a section passing through the placenta, this is how it will appear like. So, this is the maternal surface, this is the fetal surface. So, this was the umbilical cord through which the umbilical vessels have entered and then they have branched here. Whereas, these are the maternal areas, maternal surface where what is present is endometrium of the uterus. The endometrium of the uterus, once implantation happens, undergoes changes and those the changed endometrium is referred to as decidua. Decidua coming from deciduous trees, trees which shed the leaves. So, decidua is the name given to endometrium because the surface layer of the endometrium sheds. Correct? So, decidua sends in septae inside the placenta here. So, these are decidual septae. Naturally, in between the septae, one area is referred to as maternal cotyledon. That is viewed from the maternal surface. Whereas, fetal cotyledon will be one area drained by or supplied by the fetal capillaries. There will be many more than. Okay. Now, if you look at in this diagram, what is happening is from the fetal side, there is some projection that comes out, allowing the blood vessels to pass through those projections. These projecting structures are referred to as villi. Villi. Now, if you see this villus, this projection, it goes from the fetal surface right up to the maternal surface. Such a villus is referred to as stem villus, stem or anchoring villus because it anchors the fetal surface to the maternal surface. So, anchoring or stem villus. And from this projection, there are multiple branches that emerge out. Branches in anatomical terms are referred to as rami. So, the name ramus cori and further smaller rami are ramuli cori. Now, what is this chorus and cori here refers to chorion. So, anybody recalls what a chorion is? And this development of chorion. So, what structure is, structure is called as chorion? Ah, and? Ah, and? Very good. Okay. So, that is what is chorion. And then it gets differentiated and then in that layer of chorion, these projections start appearing. That is why the villi are referred to as chorionic villi. Okay, so, this is conceptually anchoring villus and branches 
are called as floating villi because they are floating. They don't reach the maternal surface. And these branches are referred to as ramus first, larger ones, and the smaller ones are called as ramuli. Now, where are these villi floating? They are floating in this space, which is referred to as intervillous space. Intervillous means between two adjacent villi. That's intervillous space. Okay. Got it? This is what is seen in this diagram. Truncus cori is also the other name for a stem villus or anchoring villus. Okay. Now, is it only blood vessel or what other structures? We will come to that. I asked the question at the right point of time because this blood vessel is there here, artery and vein, but surrounding that something else is also there. That something else is extra embryonic mesoderm. Remember, chorion is formed by somatopleuric layer of extra embryonic mesoderm also. So, that is present here. Okay. And then there will be also layer surrounding it which will be cytotrophoblast and syncytotrophoblast. Because chorion as an entity is formed by cytotrophoblast, syncytotrophoblast and somatopleuric layer of extra embryonic mesoderm. So, all those will be there in the wall. It will reach the wall of even the floating villi. The core is formed by the fetal capillaries. Okay. So now, how is the placenta formed now? So components of decidua and components of the chorion together form placenta. Decidua, as you are aware, has got three parts. Decidua basalis, decidua capsularis, decidua parietalis. It is the decidua basalis that contributes to formation of placenta. Chorion, which is trophoblast plus extra embryonic mesoderm, has got two parts. Rough part, which is called as chorion frondosum, and a smooth part, which is called as chorion leve. Leve means smooth, frondosum means rough. It is chorionic frondosum that contributes to formation of placenta. It is chorion frondosum, it appears rough because there are projections from it, which are chorionic villi. Chorionic villi are classified as primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary is the first branching, secondary is the second branching, third is the tertiary is the third branching. Period wise, what comes first is primary, what comes later is tertiary. Now, these tertiary villi are classified further as anchoring villi which extend from fetal side to the maternal side and floating villi which are branches of this stem villus or anchoring villus. Anchoring villus will have component trunk which is stem, then ramus first branching, ram villi which are smaller branch. Okay. So, this is how the classification Structurally, what is the difference? We will be seeing it diagrammatically in subsequent slides. But when we say primary villus and chorion containing trophoblast and extra embryonic mesoderm, what lies outside here is trophoblast. So, when the projection happens in such a way that it carries with it only the layer of trophoblast, cyto and syncyto trophoblast, it is called as primary villus. When the projection carries with it the core of extra embryonic mesoderm within, it is called as a secondary villus. In addition, in the mesoderm, when the fetal capillaries start developing, then the villus is referred to as tertiary villus. Okay. So, nomenclature primary, secondary and tertiary is two way. One is based on the chronology of how it develops. Primary appears first, becomes tertiary later. And the structure what the core of the villus contains. When we take a section of the villus, it will appear circular in outline. If it contains only cytotrophoblast and syncytotrophoblast, it is primary chorionic villus. If it contains extra embryonic mesoderm in the core, surrounded by the cyto and syncytotrophoblast, it is secondary chorionic villus. And tertiary chorionic villus will contain in the core fetal capillary, surrounded by extra embryonic mesoderm, surrounded by cyto and syncytotrophoblast. 
Are you all with me? Are you all with me? So let's look at the same flow chart diagrammatically. Recall this. This is the first event that happens. Formation of the chorion. Once the extra embryonic coelom develops in the mesoderm, then this portion is the chorion. And this portion is amnion. Then what happens is the chorion rearranges itself. Implantation has happened within the endometrium of the uterus. You see here the villi start appearing here, chorionic villi. Then what happens is only the part where it is in contact with the decidua basalis, that's where the rough part of the chorion remains. The other part rem becomes smooth, that's why it becomes chorion leeway and this is chorion frondosum. And this is the part that develops into placenta. These are various stages from 1, 2, 3 and 4 in the formation of chorionic villi, the primary, secondary, tertiary. So as you see here, this is a cut section of the embryo and this is an enlarged section of only this part where the placenta is. So first place what is happening is this is only cytotrophoblast which is present, this is syncytotrophoblast which is present. So there are projections that start developing. And in between the projections, there are spaces that start appearing which are called as lacunar spaces. Lacuna is a space. The next stage is when the uterine blood vessels which are there in the decidua, they start invading the lacunar spaces. The trabeculae further deepen. So you see these dots, a section when it is taken through this, this is how it appears. So this is the villus and dots are nothing but blood in the lacunar spaces. Then subsequently what happens is that maternal blood comes in this lacunar space and meanwhile extra embryonic mesoderm also comes here. Okay. So this is lacunar space surrounding that is the chorionic villus. Further stage is when intervillous space, the lacunar space is now called as intervillous space because it no longer remains restricted like this. It becomes more wider, it becomes larger. So this space is now referred to as intervillous space between the adjacent villi. Okay. By this time the extra embryonic mesoderm has formed the core of this villus. So this becomes a secondary chorionic villus. Till here it was primary, now it has become secondary. And then finally what happens is the fetal capillary starts growing within this villus. If we take a section, the core is formed by fetal capillary, surrounded by extra embryonic mesoderm, surrounded by cytotrophoblast, surrounded by syncytotrophoblast. And this is maternal blood in the intervillus space. So that means Fetal capillary contains fetal blood, intervillous space contains maternal blood. So all the structures that are between the fetal blood in fetal capillary and maternal blood in the intervillous space are the structures which form what is called as placental membrane or placental barrier. It is a barrier, barrier between fetal blood and maternal blood. So these are all the structures that form that membrane. So stages in the formation of chorionic villi, first is projection from the chorion carrying with it only cytotrophoblast and syncytotrophoblast, that is primary chorionic villus. Extra embryonic mesoderm invading this villus that forms the core, it is called secondary chorionic villus. Fetal capillaries start developing and become the core of the villus, it is called tertiary chorionic villus. This is just a recap of implantation just to understand and put things into perspective in terms of placenta. This is what happens first and then as this is happening, the conceptus moves in the fallopian tube. Whatever. Fertilization happens in the ampulla of fallopian tube 
and from ampulla it has to move towards the uterine cavity to get embedded and implantation to begin but as it is moving all these processes are happening and then finally on day 6 is when implantation begins implantation will begin when zona pellucida disappears correct if zona pellucida doesn't disappear implantation can never happen if zona pellucida disappears earlier before the movement of the conceptus then there may be abnormal sites of implantation which is referred to as ectopic pregnancy okay right so all that we saw in the diagram is what is depicted here in the flow chart so lacunar spaces in syncytial trophulas develop and erosion of maternal blood vessels happens that's how maternal blood comes into these lacunar spaces which enlarge to form intervillous space so this is where the path of the conceptus happens and finally formation of the placenta happens got it so events happen within the conceptus day 1 day 2 day 3 day 4 day 5 and finally day 6 day 7 when it reaches the uterine cavity zona pellucida disappears and the implantation begins now coming to the types of placenta based on various parameters first parameter is based on the shape quickly we'll just read through the list discoid bi discoid oval triangular irregular lobe diffuse or membrane like placenta placenta succinctivirata fenestrated and circumvellate this is the list of type of placentas based on the shape to understand this we will see the images this is discoid which is normal two discs the thickness is more so bi discoid this is oval this is triangular you can see this is no shape so irregular this is lobed this is marginal this is succinctivirata means it's broken and a separate part is there within so placenta succinctivirata fenestrated means there is an opening there so this is fenestrated and then this is called as valet or circumvallet where the fold of decidua surrounds the placenta valet valley you know no valley valley is between two peaks the depressed part is valley because there are two folds of decidua surrounding this it's called as valet or circumvallet placenta got it now based on the attachment of umbilical cord normally it is in the center of the placenta central insertion there could be para central insertion not at the center but by the side of the center third is marginal is also referred to as battle door placenta so insertion of umbilical cord is on the margin of the placenta and lastly it is attached the fetal membrane close to the peripheral margin but not exactly at the margin it is called as velamentous insertion of the umbilical cord let's look at it diagrammatically central is normal para central not at the center but a little away marginal is exactly at the margin also referred to as battle door placenta and velamentous is that it is close to the margin but not exactly at the margin then based on the distribution of umbilical arteries branches of umbilical arteries normally branching happens law of physics larger diameter will become smaller diameter that is dichotomous branching progressive reduction in size this is called as dispersed type of placenta if suppose there is dichotomous branching but the caliber remains uniform it doesn't decrease in size then such type is referred to as magistral percate is before it reaches the placental surface the umbilical vessels have already branched then it's called as percate you know bifurcate division into two trifurcate division into three so basically it is division 
So when the umbilical vessels divide before reaching the surface, then the type of placenta is referred to as furcate placenta. Got it? This is what it is. Branching already has happened and then it gets inserted. Then placenta classification also based on phylogeny. This is based on what separates maternal blood and fetal blood. So this nomenclatures which you are seeing phylogenetic nomenclatures are based on what separates the fetal blood and maternal blood. So this is maternal side and this is fetal side. This is referred to as epitheliochorial means there is a blood vessel, this is maternal blood, there is epithelium of this capillary, basement membrane of this capillary, then uterine epithelium, then there is cyto and syncytotrophoblast, then there is that is cytotrophoblast again, then there is fetal capillary which is surrounded by extra embryonic mesoderm. So, this is called as epithelioporeal. This is found in pig. Second is syndesmochorial, where the epithelium of the uterine structure has disappeared. So, it is called as syndesmo because the connective tissue only is there. Here. And this part entire is chorion. That is why syndesmochorial found in cows, so bovine. Cow, cow, buffalo, bovine, bovine is actually cow. Then comes endotheliochorial, endotheliochorial, maternal blood vessel endothelium is still intact and it directly is in contact with the layers of chorion. Therefore, this is called as endotheliochorial which is found in dogs. In human beings what happens is there is no maternal blood vessel at all, it is in intervillous space. Therefore, blood is in contact with the layers of chorion, that is why it is referred to as hemochorial. So, human placenta is hemochorial. Did you get the meaning here? Intervillous space there is maternal blood, so blood, blood is hemo, in contact with the layers of chorion, that is why hemochorial. So, human placenta is hemochorial and a step further where the layers of chorion have disappeared directly layers of the fetal capillary are there, it is hemoendothelial that is found in rabbits. This is just for the sake of understanding but what is more important is human placenta is hemochorial. Got the concept? Maternal blood vessel intact. Uterine epithelium intact is epitheliochorial. Maternal blood vessel intact, uterine epithelium lost, syndesmochorial. Maternal blood vessel intact, everything else is lost directly contact with chorion. It is endotheliochorial. Blood in the intervillous space, maternal endothelium is lost. Blood in contact with chorion is hemochorial which is human and if chorion layers are also lost, endothelium of the fetal capillary in contact with maternal blood, it is called as hemoendothelial. Got it? The same is referred to here in the table which we will skip. So, human placenta now, the terms for human placenta are as follows, hemochorial because maternal and fetal contact that is the basis. Chorio allantoic based on the source of blood supply to chorion. Now, in this context, allantoic. What is allantois? Allantois. Which day does it appear? Where does it appear from? Where does it go? 
what happens to it allo enteric diverticulum allantoic diverticulum allantois mean the same correct it develops from the hind gut that means yolk sac dorsal and caudal aspect of the yolk sac is where this projection develops from and it goes into the connecting stalk it develops on day 16 what is the purpose of development of allantois allantois helps in directing the fetal blood vessel development in the extra embryonic mesoderm why does it go to the connecting stalk what is the purpose what does connecting stalk contain extra embryonic mesoderm so allantois goes into the connecting stalk directing the extra embryonic mesoderm to form fetal blood vessels that is the prime purpose why allantois diverticulum develops after it has done its function what happens to the allantois it degenerates rudimentary it degenerates and becomes uracus uracus not eureka eureka uracus starts with the letter u uracus obliterated obliterated allantois is referred to as uracus but before becoming obliterated it does this function of directing the extra embryonic mesoderm to develop fetal blood vessels so it is human placenta is also deciduate shape is discoid cotyledonous and villous and nature of blood flow is labyrinthine it is not laminar blood flow but it flows spirally because fetal capillaries are spiral so labyrinthine blood flow coming to the crux of the class list the structures forming placental barrier is a common question in theory common question in viva start from one end and go to the other end so this is maternal blood this is fetal blood so if we start from maternal side what surrounds this maternal blood syn cytotrophoblast followed by cytotrophoblast which is resting on a basement membrane <coughs> which is followed by extra embryonic mesoderm followed by endothelium of fetal capillary which is resting on a basement membrane and then comes fetal blood <coughs> these are the structures that form placental barrier if we take a section through the villus then this is how it appears this is maternal blood this is fetal blood what structures are there syncytotrophoblast cytotrophoblast basement membrane extra embryonic mesoderm basement membrane of endothelium endothelial cells fetal blood <coughs> what is shown in this picture that the placental barrier which is thicker to begin with becomes very thin see syncytotrophoblast cytotrophoblast become very thin so the merging of <coughs> the basement membrane of cytotrophoblast and endothelium of the fetal capillary that's why between maternal blood and fetal blood what is present is only syncytotrophoblast combined basement membrane of cytotrophoblast and endothelium and endothelial cells are you getting this so this is in the first trimester of pregnancy this is in the later trimesters third trimester of pregnancy why does the placental barrier become thin as pregnancy advances why why should it become thin when it was so thick to begin with so that more exchange happens because as the fetus grows the requirement becomes more so naturally exchange is required so comes less so this is what we just listed in words let's come to functions run them quickly 
placenta is responsible for metabolism placenta is responsible for transport of various substances so which are those substances gases nutrition hormones electrolytes antibodies waste products drugs and infectious agents so is it mandatory for placenta to transport infectious agents it is not mandatory but they get transported and that forms the basis of infections of fetus through mother if mother suffers from any infection through the placenta certain infections which are acronymized as torch 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 infections of the mother they can get transmitted via placenta and the fetus may get either infected or the infective agents may induce congenital anomalies in the fetus so agents agents which are external agents that induce congenital anomalies in the baby they are referred to as very good sab to aata hai teratogens and what is teratoma any congenital malformation is called teratoma ah so it's not teratoma is a broader term but teratoma is not the name given to each and every congenital anomaly of the embryo or fetus teratoma will contain derivatives of all three germ layers that's what is more important endocrine functions of placenta hormones are secreted by placenta so much so that placenta when it secretes progesterone estrogen ovary is blocked correct ever thought placenta is a foreign substance isn't it foreign body in the body and it is attached to the mother and lives together happily if something invades blood there are blood cells in the body red blood cells white blood cells white blood cells are responsible for immunity one such entity is called as lymphocyte correct lymphocytes are of different varieties we have learnt leukopoiesis so types of lymphocytes you are aware you have learnt even lymphoid microanatomy right okay so types of lymphocytes you know b cells t cells etc etc so if anything that invades blood there is primary immune response secondary immune response what not so if anything foreign enters the blood the natural phenomenon is to act against that foreign substance so such a huge placenta is present in the mother but still that placenta doesn't get rejected there are various reasons for it that's why it's called placenta is an allograft some books also mention it homograft own tissue so in the syncytial trophoblast of basal plate that is the maternal side what happens is there is fibrinoid degeneration of the cells and they form these two layers the inner one is called as nita books layer and the outer one is called as rohr stria because of this degeneration it prevents development of immune response this is one theory what this does is it leads to formation of sulfated proteoglycans which makes them negatively charged and they repel the negatively charged maternal lymphocytes this is the theory how placenta is accepted as an allograft in the mother there are various types of abnormalities of placenta normally only the surface layer of endometrium is what is invaded you know the layers of uterine endometrium cetum basale 
certain functional is okay it's only the surface layer of uterine endometrium that is shed off normally so it's only the endometrium that is invaded by the placenta sometimes what happens is instead of the endometrium getting invaded it may go even deeper the next layer is muscle layer of the uterus it may go even deeper that is the outer perimetrium that's what is shown here normal is this only endometrium gets invaded if it gets adherent further to the basal layer of endometrium it's called accreta placenta accreta if it invades the myometrium it's called placenta increta and if it invades all the layers of the uterus and goes out it's called placenta percreta dangerous normally where is the placenta implanted upper and posterior part of the fundus of uterus that's normal site of implantation but sometimes what happens is instead of there it becomes implanted the lower part of the uterus and depending on whether it blocks the passage or not there are various grades of what is called as placenta previa previa yes previa prior is that which comes first so when the placenta comes first before the delivery of the baby it's called placenta previa it's a dangerous condition it can lead to tremendous bleeding okay we stop our discussion here on placenta and fetal membranes we'll discuss some other time